morning, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, um, friends and colleagues. Um, so welcome to the fifth Montevideo, day two of the fifth Montevideo Environmental Law Program Regional Meeting and the third ASEAN Environmental Law Conference. So um, before I kick off today's uh, session, uh, just some housekeeping announcements. And while in session, kindly put your phone on silence, please. Um, and also I've been instructed by catering um, um, that uh, we should not have open cups. I'm guilty of it, by the way, but I've taken my cup out already. <laughs> no open cups uh, or food uh, in the room. Um, tumblers with closed lid is fine. And I think water is fine. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> Demonstrate, this is the tumbler. All right. Uh, and some of you might have received a lunch card yesterday for lunch. Uh, just a reminder that you'll be given a new card every day. So whether you use the lunch card or not um, uh, every day, when you finish lunch, please give it back to the cashier at the international canteen there. You will get a new one uh, the next morning anyway. Um, and then um, also, there's a QR code at the back, if you're not already seen, QR code at the back uh, of the table there, where you can access all the meeting documents. And I know some of you have been asking for presentations that have been made, etc., for the meetings. Um, there is a folder for that in uh, uh, the, the, the QR code in the link itself. All right. So uh, without further ado, uh, I shall kick off this um, uh, meeting with a presentation on the Min Montevideo program in Asia Pacific. And we have um, Georgina Lloyd, or as I said, affectionately known by us as Georgie, um, uh, to um, deliver this presentation. Georgie? Thank you, Sally. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to day two of the meeting, and welcome to everyone who's joining us online as well. So this morning, we're going to start with an overview of what is the Montevideo Environmental Law Program. Obviously, it's the title of part of our meeting of this week, but uh, while it has been around for a very long time, indeed it's been around for more than 40 years now, it doesn't have an, a very high level of visibility amongst the environmental law community. We are now currently in the fifth iteration of the Montevideo Environmental Law Program. And this was adopted by Resolution 4 slash 20 in 2019 at the United Nations Environment Assembly. And they adopted at UNEA the fifth program for the development and periodic review of environmental law for the decade beginning 2020. So it's a 10 year program and Montevideo program five will conclude on the 31st of December, 2029. So it has the same time frame right now as the SDGs and quite a bit of the same pressure to ensure we succeed in implementing. <laughs> so this is UNEP's flagship environmental law program. And as Marlene said yesterday, it is member state led, but the success of this program depends on all of the legal stakeholders. So everyone who's here, everyone in this room and everyone online. So by its name, it is the fifth iteration of the program. And on the 31st of May uh, of last year, we actually celebrated the 40th anniversary of the program. There have been a number of successes that may, you may not necessarily attribute to Montevideo. It has enabled the conclusion of several legal instruments and guidance products such as the 1985 Montreal Guidelines for the Protection of the Marine Environment Against Pollution from Land-Based Sources, as well as support to negotiation of important multilateral environmental agreements, such as the 1985 Vienna Convention for the Protection of the Ozone Layer and the 1989 Basel Convention on the Control of Transboundary Movements of Hazardous Waste and Their Disposal. It's also through the Montevideo program that we have improved access to information 
on environmental matters and particularly in environmental law. And we have done this through both the Ecolex database and through Informea. Also, the, through Montevideo, we have supported the negotiation of new yes. international yes. Yes. You may frameworks, test your audio. Such Can as you hear me? Cinemata Convention on Mercury. Can hear you. I'm not in the room, am I? The 2010 okay? Nagoya Protocol on access to genetic resources and fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from their utilization, and the 2016 Kigali Amendment to the Mo Montreal Protocol, as well as the 2018 Escazú Agreement. So it's been a very successful program over its 40 plus years, but often those achievements we do not- Hi, Rainy, sorry, can we test it again? Montevideo. So well, I'm going, going to now to show a very, very quick, quick video. video that just introduces a little bit more about the current Montevideo program. Can you click play there? They can't, okay. Okay, um, so through the Montevideo program, we are also supporting the delivery of UNEP's medium term strategy. And UNEP acts as the secretariat to support implementation under the program. This program, while it's its fifth version, builds on the successes of the last 40 years of work in environmental law. So it is a decade of action. And one thing to note is that it is built also through this network of national focal points. The national focal points are key actors in the delivery and success of the program because the national focal points contribute to the focus of priorities under the program 
through meetings, including this one, this regional meeting of national focal points. There are also strong collaboration with multilateral environmental agreement secretariats, with other UN agencies, with international NGOs, with judiciaries, with academics, civil society, and, and others. It also, as was mentioned, has a strong governance framework. There is a steering committee that leads the intergovernmental process, and there are biannual global meetings, and we're going to have the next global meeting of the Montevideo program next year in Nairobi. While the program is a global program, it predominantly has a national focus. So it covers the implementation and development of environmental law at multiple levels, but it really focuses on providing support to countries at the national level. And it does this through receiving technical assistance requests from countries, including through UNEP Loop. The program seeks to address a key number of environmental law challenges. And these challenges are the inadequate development of appropriate environmental legislation and legal frameworks. Second, the weak implementation and enforcement of environmental legislation and legal frameworks. Indeed, in most cases, there are very strong laws in place but more is needed to support implementation and compliance with those laws. The third is the lack of coordination on national, regional and global levels in the development and implementation of environmental rule of law. And again, that's why regional meetings such as this are so important to support cohesive action at the regional level. And the fourth is that environmental rights are not being realized by the public. And of course, we have the UN General Assembly resolution recognizing the human right to a healthy environment. And now we need to support implementation of that right. So the progr program operates with, through UNEP as its secretariat. And the program has nine strategic activity areas. And I'm going to go through these on the next slide, but they're going to be important to remember because we're going to come back to these strategic areas several times throughout the, the dialogue and discussion today. There are also a number of implementation guidelines that have been developed under the program to support countries in the development and implementation of environmental law. And one of those is the um, guidelines that have been developed on air pollution. And I think there's still a copy of this publication at the back of the room, and we discussed it a little bit yesterday. But that's just one example. Another example is the Global Environmental Rule of Law Report. Uh, and we have a couple of copies of that if you would like to have a look at that as well. So looking to the nine strategic areas, these are essentially um, categories in which we will implement the Montevideo program. So we have through guidance products, through data exchange, through the realization of access rights, through strong partnerships, education and awareness, research, through the pillars of the UN, which is peace and security, human rights and development, and through training. So some examples of how these have been implemented over the last couple of years. Starting with the, the guidance products, as I mentioned, we have the Global Environmental Rule of Law Report. We have the Global Study and Guidelines on Air Pollution Legislation. We also have uh, released global guidance on single-use plastic legislation, as well as the recent Global Report on Climate Change Litigation, which was released uh, just this month, earlier this month. We also have regional guidance products, some of which were highlighted in the opening yesterday, such as the guidelines on realization of children's rights to a healthy environment in ASEAN. Also, knowledge products on environmental rule of law and environmental rights in the region. Then looking at data, online platforms and products. As we mentioned, UNEP Leap is the strong digital backbone of the program, but we also have Informea, 
and Informea provides information about all multilateral environmental agreements. It has country profiles, which show who are country focal points for all of the relevant MEAs. It also has all of the submissions, the country reports. Uh, it also has um, all of the, the COP findings and, and outputs as well. And also under Informea, we have an online training portal where there are a large number of free to access training modules on multilateral environmental agreements, as well as specific trainings for certain target groups like judges. And this afternoon or this evening, we're going to be launching a new training course uh, for judges in Asia and the Pacific. Looking to access rights, we have of course supported the implementation of the Escazú Agreement in Latin American Caribbean, but also we are learning from that Escazú Agreement in Asia and the Pacific, particularly in ASEAN, through supporting the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights to explore an environmental rights framework. We've also been supporting environmental law clinics, as we heard yesterday, as well as regional forums for groups that are protecting the environment and are particularly vulnerable, including um, the Environmental Human Rights Defender Forum. Under partnerships, we have many examples of partnerships and we're gonna have a whole session on partnerships and how we can build on those later today. But not only do we work with external partners, we also work with a lot of UN partners, including the UN country teams, as well as other UN agencies. And through the uh, UN Environment, uh, sorry, the yes, the UN Environment Management Group, we also integrate these guidance across secretariat-wide um, strategies. Under education and awareness, we have supported uh, many trainer the trainer programs in environmental law. In fact, I know that a number of you in this room have participated in the TTT programs on environmental law. And we've done this in close collaboration with the Asian Development Bank or UNEP has supported Asian Development Bank. Uh, also with Asian Development Bank, uh, as well as other partners, there's been support to the Legal Education Board of the Philippines. Uh, and again, I know that many of you uh, here have participated in that, uh, as well as looking at twinning of courts. So we have supported the twinning uh, also of um, the New South Wales Land and Environment Court with courts in Asia. Um, we've also done specific online courses for education and awareness, including a course for the Pacific lawyers and judges, as well as a rights-based climate litigation course, a course for national human rights institutions as well on, on the environment and protecting the environment. For research, there are many frontier publications that UNEP has put out and through leadership at regional forums, encouraging academic research in environmental law, including the ASEAN Environmental Law Conference, where we're gonna have many sessions tomorrow looking at some of the latest research in environmental law. And then finally, looking at training. And the importance here is sustainable training. So working very closely with enforcement officials, customs, ju judges, and others to enforce environmental law. Um, and we have also done this in partnership with regional MEAs, such as the Coordinating Body of the Seas of East Asia, COBSI, and others. So these are just some examples of the types of activities that are done under these strategic activity areas. And as I say, we're gonna come back to these because throughout today, we're going to have sessions on climate change, on legal responses to climate change, on legal responses to biodiversity. And then we're gonna have a session on partnerships. And throughout those sessions, there are opportunities to explore where we can enhance or advance um, or further leverage the types of activities we can do under these areas. We mentioned uh, during, sorry, this is text here is a bit small, but <laughs> the PowerPoint will be available. Um, but we mentioned that there are three main thematic areas, as well as these strategic activity areas. There, there are three thematic areas. And these, of course, are pollution, 
climate change and biodiversity. Um, and these were agreed at the last meeting, national, uh, sorry, the global meeting of national focal points where the co-chairs presented a non-paper outlining proposed priority areas for implementation under the program. So these are the three thematic areas. And then there is also a cross-cutting area of integrated responses, which includes enhancing access to environmental information, public participation, and access to justice, as well as strengthening education and capacity building in environmental law. So those are the, the thematic areas and the cross-cutting areas of the Montevideo program. And then finally, I wanted to share the, the link to the LEAP platform. And again, this will be clickable uh, once you get access to the PowerPoint. We encourage everyone to go onto the UNEP LEAP platform and explore the platform because not only is it um, the avenue to request support through the program, there's also a huge amount of information there. There's case law, there's, um, there's legislation, there's um, information on country profiles, there's information on multilateral environmental agreements and many other things as well. And increasingly, we're gonna be putting more information up there, including toolkits for negotiators under multilateral environmental agreements and, and others. Um, so please do have a look at the UNEP fleet. So with that, I, I thank you uh, and we will continue the rest of the day. Thank you. All right, so now we're gonna do something a bit fun. We're gonna take photos, um, but we're gonna be doing it in, uh, uh, Tom, are you ready? So maybe we do the round, the, the U table first. So um, the, the country delegates, you stay where you are, but face the camera up there, right? Yeah. And the rest, can you sort of come over here? The, the point is that we try and get everybody into the picture and all looking at the camera there. Post number one. We have post number two later. So the whole point is that we don't block the banner at the bottom here. Uh, <laughs> or don't, <laughs> we, we will try to get people into the center later for the next post.
โอเคครับแอนคิวจอร์ดีโอเคแอนคิวเช็คอิทิสอีโคอิง
But thank you very much, Georgie, introducing uh, me. Uh, at least you didn't mention that I have the law background, which I don't have. Okay, so I'll not talk about what kind of the litigation is going on related to climate change or what kind of the, the action that, that I can do, but probably you can do uh, as, as, as a legal expert uh, in this area. Um, and, and before I start, I was also having a talk and, and someone is saying that, are we progressing and say, yes, but slow, but he's saying that at least we are not even not saying that we are regressing. So that is the context why I have actually mentioned that the urgency to transform the climate action, because what we are doing so far is not adequate. And I'm just going to talk about that. And, and let me begin uh, by mentioning the Paris Agreement. And many of you have heard about it, many of you have read about it, but I'd like to just highlight a couple of points uh, under the Paris Agreement. The first one is the temperature goal, which basically says limiting the increase of the global uh, average temperature to well below two degrees centigrade and pursuing the efforts to limit it to 1.5 degree above the pre-industrial level. I know that when I talk to my lawyer friend, they say, what do you mean by well below two degree? Can you explain that? So, so maybe you can start thinking, what does that really mean? <clears throat> but it also <clears throat> talked about that how we are going to achieve that well uh, below the two degree or pursuing for the 1.5 degree. One is reaching the global peaking of the greenhouse gas emission as soon as possible. So that is in the document. But if we look into what currently going on in terms of the country's commitment to uh, peak their emission, particularly the greenhouse gases, uh, some countries they're saying by 2030, some is saying that after 2030, but also many countries in the Asia Pacific region announces their carbon neutrality target either by 2050 or 2060 or some countries the 2070. And, and, and many countries they have not announced when they're going to do their carbon neutrality. So that is where we stand in terms of picking the emission. But also the Paris Agreement, another important <clears throat> the decision there is prepare and communicate nationally determined contribution. This means is basically a bottom-up approach that every country will come up with their own commitments, but that needs to commensurate with the 1.5 degree or below two degree target. And then I'll be elaborating where we stand in terms of that matching the target and the commitment. Second area is the adaptation because impact is already happening and we are seeing the devastation in Asia. Uh, is basically what it says that we need to increase the ability to adapt and we need to do that through three things. And, and those three things has been mentioned under the global goal on adaptation. One is reducing vulnerability enhancing adaptive capacity and strengthening resilience. And, then, and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has the detailed definition of what do we mean by all of those terminologies. Then the third area is the finance. I think if we start talking about the finance, it will override every discussion that, that we are going to do. So I'm not going to talk about the climate finance, but I'll mention where we stand. There are also other elements in terms of the market mechanism to help the countries to fulfill their commitments, as well as they have the MRV, how they are going to monitor their commitment and reporting that. So, so those are the additional elements as well in the Paris Agreement. Now, let me mention about why the urgency that we are talking about. If we, if we look into the changes happen already in terms of the temperature, in the 2011 to 2020, the global surface temperature has increased uh, 
about 1.1 degree above the 1850 to 1900. <clears throat> That's the period. So when we are talking about the limiting 1.5 degree, we already increased the 1.1 degree. So, so the window is, is very, very small and narrow. If we also look into that IPCC report, is the first two decades of this century is basically the temperature was 0.99, or you can say the one degree higher than the period that I mentioned is the 1815 to 1900. Now, the recent WMO report, what they said, that the temperature is going to rise by more than 1.5 degree before 2030. It's basically saying that 2027 will we're going to reach that 1.5 degree. Um, so, so that is is the the state where we stand in terms of the temperature increase, and the increasing of this temperature has the other uh, effect in terms of the rainfall variability, the melting of the glaciers, and many others. I'm going to mention some of those. And if we look into the IPCC report, it is also saying that if we follow the middle path in terms of our growth, it's not the very green, not very high on the fossil fuel. If we just follow the middle path, then the temperature is likely to increase 2.1 degree to 3.5 degree by end of the century. Now, as I indicated in this, the temperature increase, it is going to intensify the impacts. And if we look into which are the areas that IPCC mentioned, is the water scarcity, the food production. And if we look into the Asia and the Pacific region, the glacier in Asia are the sources of the water resources for about 220 million people downstream. So, so the large number of the people depending on that, and we are seeing that the melting is happening in Tibetan Plateau, and which is going to continue melting uh, till the 2050. And melting this, the glacier, uh, has an impact in terms of the stability of the water resources and supply. If we look into the food production, it is also going to be impacted. And, and some of the statistics are here in terms of uh, what is the, the scale of that impact uh, in terms of decreasing the production. For India, it may go 10 to 30%, assuming the temperature increases one to four degrees centigrade. Um, if we look into the health area, uh, it is also the issue of the disease. It is also the issue of the demand for the high energy, particularly in the cities when the temperature rise, people tend to use the more cooling devices and that increases the demand. And also the mental health issues and also the migration, which is happening in many Pacific Island countries, as well as many low-lying coastal area uh, in the region. If we just move the cities and the settlement, this is also another area where the impact is going to be high. As many of you know that by 2050, 64% of the Asian population will be uh, living in urban area. In terms of the cities, this is where the most of the people and because of the cities are either located in the coastal area or closer to the flat line. So the impact is going to be very high because of the location of the cities and the settlement. But also don't forget that we also have large number of the informal settlement in the region. So that is the another the low adaptive capacity of the people. If we look into the infrastructure, is obviously the infrastructure is going to be impacted as well as the ecosystem and ecosystem services. Now, that is the one part of the impacts that is going to come. Now, in terms of the 1.5 degree or keeping it well below two degree, if we look into the commitment, as I mentioned earlier, that every country committed to communicate their nationally determined contribution to keep the temperature below two degree or for 1.5 degree. Now, if we look into all the indices submitted so far, including the updated indices up to the COP26, 
the gap is high. And, and if you look into this chart, you will see that the conditional and the unconditional pledges. In the NDC, the country basically committing, yes, I will able to reduce X amount of my greenhouse gases by my own, with my own resources, but I will able to do more if I get the finance technology and the capacity building, and that is called the conditional. If we look into that conditional and unconditional, gap is, is really, really high. So, so this, is, this is what we need to work on. And as per the IPCC, if we need to basically keep the temperature rise 1.5 degree, we need to reduce the greenhouse gas emission 45%, I'm repeating, 45% below 2010 level. So that is, that is what we need to aim for if we really would like to keep that. Now, if we move to the Asia, I know that I'm taking probably a couple of minutes more than allocated, but please bear with me. Uh, so if we look into the energy use uh, in this region, is basically the energy accounts for about 73.5% of the greenhouse gases. If we go by the sector, uh, we see that the energy industry is, is that the first then the buildings and the transport. So we know that with sectors is emitting more and where the action is unnecessary. But also in Asia, one of the, the appetite of the country is to use the coal for, for their uh, power generation. And is it approximately 50% of the energy in the region coming from coal? Uh, if we look into um, the commitment from this region particularly, we see that the countries are, are failing short of their greenhouse gas emission reduction that can support the 1.5 degree pathway. Um, instead of reading all those points, but let me just mention one thing. If all the countries implement their indices entirely, still the greenhouse gas will increase 16% compared to the 2010 level. Then you can obviously talk about whether the country will able to implement their NDC in its entirety. Obviously, there is a question mark. Uh, but even then, it is not going to be adequate. So we need to actually gradually go for the carbon neutrality or the zero carbon. There are the definitional issues. Um, but one thing I'd like to just mention, which may be of your interest in the point of the legal side, Many countries in the region, they have enacted their climate act, they have enacted their climate policy, but many countries haven't done that. So that could be one of the area from the, the legal point of view, maybe this group can think of how to support the countries to basically develop either the climate act or the policies and make it legally binding at the national level. Uh, let me just end what I mentioned in terms of the Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, which is related to the carbon market. Now the decision is, is in place, but countries need support um, to utilize that carbon market. And it has not only the technical aspect in terms of the baseline, it also has the issues technical uh, related to accounting but it is also issues related to the laws and the regulation because this is in a transacting the greenhouse gases from one country to the another country and how that is going to be adjusted when a country is transferring this greenhouse gas to another country, how they're going to do what we call the corresponding adjustment between the two countries. With that, I'd like to thank you all and I'll be happy to provide more information uh, if, if you feel necessary. Thank you, Jordi, over to you. Thank you very much, Babu, for that important summary and very clear messages in the need for greater ambition in, short, in, to, in order to address climate change in the region and globally. We're now going to turn to our next speaker, Bryony Eels, who is joining us virtually. Um, can we have Bryony up on the screen, please? Hi, good morning, Bryony. Great to see you. 
Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so you are going to present on leveraging multilateral and national legal me measures to address the climate crisis in Asia Pacific. Bryony, you have the floor. So hi, everyone. A very, very warm hello from Manila. I'm sorry that I can't be there. I've had a very heavy travel schedule, so excuse, excuse me. Anyway, so as Georgie said, I'm looking at leveraging multilateral and national legal frameworks to address the climate crisis in Asia and the Pacific. I would like to pause to acknowledge the climate-induced tragedy unfolding in the Pacific, in Hawaii. And I also want to acknowledge the people who have already been displaced by sea level rise in the Pacific. Climate change is happening to people now, and it is tragic. So, but also thank you very much, Georgie, to UNEP and also to Ariel for inviting me to speak at this really important conference. I thought to, in order to understand where we are and therefore the work that we as a community of lawyers need to go and to undertake, it's useful to have a perspective of how the global legal framework has emerged and how that is shaping domestic responses. So firstly, we need to remember that the international legal framework on climate change has been disjointed or siloed from legal frameworks on biodiversity, so the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, forests, and this is affecting national legal frameworks. So we all know we have the Paris Agreement, we had the UNFCCC 1992, the Kyoto Protocol 1997, and the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement was groundbreaking. It set a clear temperature goal, as we've just heard, uh, but its emphasis on adaptation, the use of nationally determined contributions, and technological and resource transfers was groundbreaking. So the agreement was really fundamental for creating a common standard, but increasing international cooperation, particularly around finance and technology flows, which is critical. It was also premised on promoting sustainable development and environmental integrity. But despite this, unfortunately, it mentions biodiversity once, and it's silent on nature and nature-based solutions which is not that great for Asia and the Pacific that are much more focused on adaptation in the large part. And this siloed approach where policymakers historically treated these issues, climate change, biodiversity, pollution, forests as interrelated issues, but created these siloed legal frameworks. So this was only recently recognized as an issue. In 2020, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and, and IPCC and the Intergovernmental Panel on Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Ecoservice, IPBES, met to workshop how they could better integrate climate change and biodiversity conservation solutions. What they found that the current policy and legal regimes addressing climate change and biodiversity were disconnected, both globally and locally, which had led to missed opportunities to deploy actions that alleviate these challenges together. So it found that both CBD and UNFCCC tended to lack clear and effective mechanisms to find point of commonality or to explicitly consider the interactions. And so what this meant is that in nationally determined contributions, they didn't have to specify how climate mitigation actions might affect biodiversity or how bi biodiversity might assist with climate responses. And so what we've seen is NDCs as far as 2020, deprioritizing integrated actions around ecosystems and climate and national adaptation programs of action, lacking detail about how adaptation would impact or strengthen adaptation. This was 
finally also recognized at COP27 late last year in Egypt, where the Conference of Parties to the Paris Agreement finally recognized that it's one interlinked global crisis. Sustainable climate action needs to protect, conserve, restore, and sustainably use nature. Responses to climate change and biodiversity loss also need to connect to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, likewise, in 2020, we also had the COP for the CBD, which created new goals and targets on biodiversity, setting four goals and 23 targets to be achieved within this coming decade, including a 3030 target. This 3030 target calls on governments to protect 30% of their land and oceans by 2030 and to restore their degraded land and oceans by 2030 to enhance biodiversity and ecosystem functions, services, ecological integrity and connectivity. So it really took until late 2020 to start seeing this interlinked global legal framework, recognizing the need of a whole of planet, whole of government approach. And this ideology now needs to track through into domestic legal frameworks. So as I mentioned before, we've seen a global trend towards siloed responses. In recent times though, I think it's fair to say that Asia and Pacific countries have become adept at central coordination of strategic development plans that cut across sectors. So they increasingly integrate environment and climate considerations. And these agencies have a convening power to bring line agencies to the table to break down silos. So what I'm saying is some of the work that needs to happen moving forward and how we leverage frameworks is to start focusing on integrated solutions and breaking down silos. And there are some examples of national strategies that consciously attempt to integrate biodiversity, climate and disaster risk reduction objectives, but they are still the, object, still the exception. When I reviewed in 2022 NDCs, I found that um, only in the context, they only mentioned biodiversity in the context of how they might um, contribute nature-based solutions to enhance climate adaptation, not how they might contribute to emission reduction. Also, most of the National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plans only mentioned climate change as a driver of biodiversity loss. Law and policy makers now face this hyper complex task of creating policies and laws that established integrated national responses to climate change, biodiversity, and the achievement of sustainable development goals. So they need to create integrated solutions across pretty much every sector. Every law and policy now needs to be conscious of how it is responding to the planetary crises. So do urban planning laws adapt to heat? Uh, are we seeing building codes that are conserving energy, for example? So it's understanding those connections that we need to be looking at at the domestic level. So that's domestic solutions need to respond to these 21st century challenges and social expectations. So that also means that our laws need to be informed by multi-sectoral and multi-stakeholder engagement. And we need to consider how the laws can create frameworks to allow that to happen. An example of that is in Fiji, which created a National Climate Change Coordination Committee. So that's your multi-sectoral engagement. But we also need to think about participatory rights. So how do we create systems that allow multi-stakeholder engagement with a right of participation and protecting the ability of people who are vulnerable to climate change to meaningfully participate in national feedback loops or local climate action 
groups. And laws, it's not enough that we have laws. As Georgie mentioned earlier, we have laws. We need them to be effective, collaborative, but there needs to be a monitoring system. And that monitoring system doesn't mean much if it doesn't have a feedback loop that allows our ambition to increase over time to the highest possible ambition. One of the issues with the highest, so, so essentially what I'm saying is the standards need to set a floor, not a ceiling. It needs to get better over time. And part of the challenge we have is that the Paris Agreement doesn't define highest possible ambition. So there's this principle of, connect, of progression, but it's only connected to NDC cycles, which as we know are five years. It's not really aligned with science. It's not really asking how fast does progression need to happen? And that is something that countries can be considering and leveraging in their policy and legal frameworks. So of course, none of this is easy. It takes vision. It takes time, it takes resources, money, technology, and skills. And that is where and why the Montevideo Environmental Law Program, as well as ADB's Law and Policy Program, program are crucial for supporting capacity building and law reform. We need to support governments in the region to embed our understanding of the biodiversity climate interface as the cornerstone of national development planning. So in conclusion, the environmental law community really does have a role to play, a very special role. It needs to highlight these imperatives, including through litigation and capacity building, but importantly, we need to listen and we need to build frameworks that inbuild that listening and that capacity for improvement over time. Thanks so much, Georgie. Thank you very much, Bryony. That's provided a lot of food for thought for our dialogue session that's coming up. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to Renee, who is going to share with us um, the, the process for the dialogue session and introduce to us the, the discussion questions that we'll be answering. Thank you, Renee. Thank you so much, Georgie, and good morning again to everyone. I think the first two presentations really set the foundation and the context for the discussions that we'll be having for the rest of the day. And on that, I wanted to thank you all for being here because um, during the course of the day, we'll be really looking to you for your feedback on how to develop Montevideo program, especially how to implement the climate change aspect of Montevideo program further. So my presentation is gonna be short. I'm going to explain this morning um, how we're going to organize the discussion sessions and what kind of feedback we'd like to hear from you. So this is a, I'm gonna start with a timeline and um, I'm gonna, it, begin, it began in June, 2022, um, where we had the first in-person meeting of national focal points for the Montevideo program. Um, Georgie gave you some background on the Montevideo program and the and and how and the governance structure of it. But in a nutshell, there was the first in-person global meeting of national focal points in June 2022, where national focal points agreed to um, three thematic priority areas on climate change, biodiversity, and pollution. Um, they they articulated these three thematic areas further and came up with six priority areas. I won't go into them, but what we'll focus today, um, our focus this morning will be on climate change. But what we do need to produce, and I'll just show you the end of the timeline, is an options paper. National Focal Points requested the Montevideo Secretariat to develop a paper of options on how to address legal responses to climate change. And over the course of the past year uh, or more, we have been um, working towards developing this options paper to present to national focal points for their approval next year. So this is what we are doing along the way to get to that point. Now we're having regional consultations with you, um, the Asia Pacific region, 
Um, we'll be having consultations with the Africa region um, also during the course of this month. We'll then be having consultations with the Latin America and Caribbean region in September. And we will be having uh, the, the, um, the meeting of the steering committee at the end of this year, where we will present the first draft of the options paper for review of national focal, by national focal points. So these are the steps that we're going to take to get towards the development of, a, of an options paper. At the end of these consultations, we hope to, with your feedback, we hope to develop a draft options paper to, pre to present to the steering committee in November. Um, and this is why your feedback is so essential. Um, your feedback today will really, um, I don't know why the, maybe you can, the PowerPoint can move on, but this, your feedback today will really be essential in developing the options paper. Um, I just wanted to quickly show you what priority area four is about, because that will be the focus of our discussion uh, this morning. It, the, we were asked to focus on developing an, a, a report on options for legal responses to address climate change that would strengthen, develop, or implement appropriate legal and institutional frameworks at the national or subnational level and build related capacity. We were also asked to ensure that this avoids duplication with other processes under the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement. So yes, the idea is to ensure that we um, come up with a list of priority areas that really aligns with our mandate and avoids overlap or at least promote synergies with other processes. So these are some of the questions we'll be asking you this morning. Um, and we'll manage this in our breakout sessions and we'll have this up um, in the breakout rooms as well. But we want to hear from you based on your needs within the region, what should be the thematic areas of priority under this topic? And then we want to know also what kind of activities do you think might best address these thematic areas? Who should be the beneficiaries of this activity? So who should this activity really target? And who is already working in this thematic area or activity that you've identified earlier? Who should we collaborate with? I mean, we have, we have networks in the region, and I think that we have an idea of, some, of what might be some of your priorities, but I think the best source of this information would come from you. And so we really look forward to having your feedback. Um, we're going to divide into um, groups, two groups. And we will address four areas of intervention. The first being topic one, the development and implementation of adequate and effective legislation and legal frameworks address climate change. So you will be answering the three questions identified previously according to these different topics. Um, you've all been um, provided with stickers with colors on them, and that will, um, that will indicate which room you should be in. So those dealing with topic one should stay in this room. This is conference room four. The second topic is on awareness raising initiatives at different levels. And you'll also be staying in this room. And we'll have two other groups going to meeting room A, which is just outside and to the left. Um, on the topic three, will, which will be enhanced capacity building for increased effectiveness of environmental law for all stakeholders at all levels. And green will be topic for research and knowledge development and issues related to legal responses to climate change. So these are four areas of intervention, which, which, which we would like your feedback on thematic areas and key activities on. Um, so I think with, if anyone doesn't have a sticker, please uh, put your hand up and somebody will come to you. Okay maybe keep your hand up so that uh, the person with the stickers can come to you and, and give you one. But um, so that's it, thank you so much. We'll have uh, a couple hours to, to facilitate these discussions and we'll give you, once we're in our groups, we'll give you more discussions on how to, um, to break out. For those online, we um, appreciate that you, you aren't here and you won't be able to participate in these discussions, but we've provided a survey um, which we really would appreciate if you can click on and provide some feedback. All the feedback collected online and in this room will go towards the development of an options paper on legal responses to climate change, which will 
um, which will inform the implementation of the Montevideo program of UNEP. So we really encourage you, please, those who can't be here to go online um, at the URL provided, or at, uh, if you can, you can also access it using the, the QR code. Please access our um, survey online and answer the same questions that we're asking our, um, our colleagues and participants in the room. Thank you so much. And we look forward to having these consultations. Okay, thank you very much, Renee. So now we're going to go into these groups and we're going to discuss amongst ourselves. So can I ask everyone who's yellow and green, please to, to move over to meeting room A. You will have two facilitators over in meeting room A, which is uh, Sally and Sylvia. Um, so they are going to take you over to meeting room A and explain the questions and the questions will be up for you in meeting room A for you to discuss. And we will be doing this discussion through until lunchtime, till 12 o'clock. So you have about an hour and a bit to discuss. So everyone else who is orange and blue, can you please stay in this room? So we'll just wait for everyone who is yellow and green to, to move out. Okay, so everyone who's here with us now are orange and blue. Um, can we get all of the orange stickers, please, over to this side of the room? Everyone who's orange over here and everyone who's blue over this side. Yeah, so orange people over this side and blue over this side. But they want. Yes, that's what I said. Yeah, <laughs> blue is this side. Okay, so can everyone who's orange remember looking at legislation and legal frameworks and everyone who's blue is looking at awareness raising? Yeah, because I'm going to put up the discussion questions. 